Yeah, so just to kind of start out, who already knows what Spanish and or read the docs are? Just raise your hand. Yeah, maybe heard of it, maybe. Yeah. Heard of write the docs and we're like, what? That sounds kind of the same. <laughs> uh, cool, yeah, so that's good. Makes us an introduction. So we're going to kind of go through, or that was the next slide. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, first off, we're going to talk about why you should write documentation. Uh, this is mostly directed at programmers. So if you're not a programmer, you can still get a lot of value out of it by using these arguments against the programmers you know <laughs> to write documentation. Uh, and then we're going to kind of get into the, the technical material, uh, starting with the structured text, which is a markup language very similar to Markdown. Uh, then we'll talk about Sphinx, which is actually a documentation generator that's you know, creating these documentation sets that your users will presumably see. And then we'll talk about Read the Docs, which is a uh, hosting platform for said documentation. So who am I and why should you listen to me? Um, I am one of the creators and kind of current maintainer of Read the Docs, which is kind of how I got started in this whole crazy kind of documentation world. And then I'm also a co-organizer of the Write the Docs conference, which happens in Portland every year. Um, I think we had about 300 people in the Crystal Ballroom maybe six weeks ago or so. Uh, which is pretty awesome. So if you're interested in documentation, uh, we have a European event and a US event every year. So feel free to come check that out next year. And that's really just about all things documentation and you know whatever you want it to be, it can be if you promote a uh, proposed talk. So what you should do as the audience, we're in a really small room. Feel free to stop me if anything's unclear or you know at the end of the slide, like, you know, raise your hand, ask a question. Stop me if I'm talking too fast or you don't understand something. Feel free, again, to ask questions. Uh, at the end of each kind of section of content, I'll have a question slide. So if you're not comfortable kind of interrupting me in the middle, there'll be kind of sections at each point before we go on, because all of these topics kind of build on each other, so we want to make sure that you kind of are understanding what's going on before we move to the next thing. And then hopefully you'll learn something, and uh, that's, that's the goal of presenting here today. So why should you write documentation? My favorite example is just kind of a selfish plea to programmers. That's that you'll be using your own code in six months. I don't know, like, as a programmer, this has happened to me where I get assigned a bug at work and I go in and I'm like, who could have possibly written this awful code? This is horrible. And I go in and do like a git blame or whatever and it's like, oh, <laughs> that was me. <mean. laughs> Over time, your kind of knowledge and you know the understanding that you had when you were doing something kind of fades away. And if you don't write it down, you lose all of that kind of state that you build up in your mind. You've done all this research and you figured this out, and you're like, I'm going to build it a specific way. And if you don't write that down, all of that kind of just gets lost over time. So even if there's nobody else using the code that you're writing, you should think about documenting it just for yourself. So when you come back later, it's much easier to kind of regain the mental state that you were in when you were writing the code. The second reason is you, you want people to use this code. Usually when we're, we're writing code, we're trying to do something, we're trying to solve a problem, we're trying to build something, there's, there's something in the world that we are trying to you know, change in some way. And a lot of the times we don't do that just for us, right? We're in a company where we're building a module for another team that might want to use it in the future, or we're working on open source where we want to build a community around a project and there are all these other people who we want to get using our code. If you don't, if someone like lands on your GitHub page and your readme doesn't, you know, explain what it is that your code does, you don't document how to use it, how to install it, nobody's ever gonna use it. They're just gonna land on this page and be like, oh, I don't know what this does. It's not worth my time to look in and figure out and like read through the actual code. You need to tell me that this is gonna solve my problem before I invest any more time in the code that you wrote. So we're out there, we're building things, we want people to use them. It feels so good to have people using your open source code. It's one of the most amazing feelings in open source is when you get a bug report. And someone's like, hey, I tried to use this and this didn't work. It's like, Somebody just used the thing that I made? <laughs> um, that, that's a feeling that we should all get. And if you document your code, it will happen much more frequently. And it makes your code better. Um, I don't know who here is familiar with the concept of readme-driven development. I'm a big fan of this, which is the concept of when you start a project or you start building something, you kind of write out the readme first. You're like, what problem am I trying to solve? What is the API going to look like? So like, 
when somebody goes to use this code, here's what they'll use, they'll import this, and then they'll do this, and you build out kind of the, the mental model of the user of the code before you start writing code. And when you just kind of start writing code without documenting and kind of thinking about it first, it kind of grows this organic API, and it just kind of becomes a, the way that you use it is a, just kind of how it got built, and there was never any thought into how the user's actually going to use it before you started building it. If you take the time and really kind of think through how your code's going to be used, it'll make the way that you build it better, and it'll make it easier for people to use in the future, rather than just be this kind of afterthought when you're like, oh, we have to make this so another program can call it, or all these other kind of things that, if you think about them up front, make the design of your code much better. This is one that is, seems obvious, but I think it's something that people really forget, especially in the open source world. We spend a lot of our time using text to explain technical ideas to other people. Whether that be a commit message, a bug report, an email, a mailing list thread, our medium of choice is text. In your job, there's so much text, and you want to be a better writer, and you want to be able to talk about text in a meaningful way that's concise and get your point across and isn't misunderstood. That's one of the most important skills that you can have as a programmer today, in my opinion, because that's all we do. When you're working on open source, you're talking about ideas about code with people in text, and that is an incredibly important skill. And so when you write documentation, that's effectively what you're doing. You're practicing writing in a technical manner to be read by other people. And so having these skills to become a better writer really makes you a better programmer, a better employee, and just you know, a better all-around kind of person in the industry. Any questions so far? I think those are kind of the big reasons that I really think about writing documentation. You know, there's selfish ones, there's ones where you want to improve yourself, it makes your code better. Um, I think these are really kind of important lessons to learn about conceptualizing why you should actually be writing documentation. Um, uh, so I thought the, the point about uh, you want to be a better writer is awesome. Um, and one part of that is like getting feedback from your readers, and I mean you might get into this later, but uh, I think that seems like one of the difficulties with writing documentation is like knowing how other people are going to want to use your writing. Sure. Um, so like, can you talk a little bit about how to build in those feedback loops to, to make the writing better? Sure. Um, so I've done that in two ways, kind of classically. One is um, all the projects on Read the Docs that we generate have an edit on GitHub or edit on GitHub, uh, Bitbucket button, which allows people to kind of submit feedback in the form of a patch, where it's like, oh, I was reading this page and either this is wrong or there's something, you know, the obvious thing is a typo and they just like, I want to fix this. But also if they have kind of like, I want to contribute, there's something here that's missing, something that's wrong, and that gives them kind of a, a one-click way to kind of go in and say, I want to contribute this back, which kind of lowers the contribution barrier. The other one is comments, right? Um, kind of comments at the bottom of a document are really useful for that, where it's like, hey, I wanted to do this, or this is, you know, kind of provides a feedback mechanism. Uh, one of the things I've been kind of investigating is the, I don't know if you're familiar with the <coughs> Uh, where they have the, kind of the paragraph level comments. Mm. And that's something that's really powerful because then you can get much more kind of contextual and you can be like, all right, this paragraph, let's talk about that. And it's not just this kind of pile of stuff at the bottom. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, I'm sorry, did, so familiar with what? Uh, Medium. Uh, Medium.com is just a publishing platform. Thank they you. Like marching out and comments on the side. Right. Yeah, so like okay. each, each paragraph you're able to kind of comment on individually rather than you know just the thing of a whole as a whole. And that's also something I'm really curious more about. Uh, I've thought about doing some like machine learning and, and having more it's like, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Slashdot, but it has one of the classic kind of moderation systems where it's like, you know, rate this one to five because it was funny, insightful, you know, it's like here's like seven things and here's a star rating, right? And just getting a little bit more data into like, you know, this didn't solve my problem, but it was useful or, uh, so I think there's a lot more we could be doing in the realm of kind of getting feedback. And I would love to talk more about that. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of the, the overarching, you know, why should you care about documentation? This is kind of the, the tech stack that I'm talking about that I think solves this problem in an interesting way. So kind of, we're going to be working out from the middle. And so restructured text is just a markup language. Um, so here's familiar with Markdown. 
So most people, uh, I'll have an example of restructured text in the slides, so we can actually, you know, so you can comprehend a little bit more about what it looks like. Uh, but restructured text is very similar. It's just a plain text markup language that you that renders into other formats, uh, and that's the next section of the talk. And then doc details is just something I'm not going to talk too much about, but it's what actually parses restructured text, takes it from a file, and turns it into you know a hierarchy of objects inside of your program. So if you see that, just don't get confused. That's just kind of the middle layer. So then Sphinx uses docutils and takes those hierarchies and adds a bunch of um, specific things for documenting software onto the markup, and then also outputs stuff into multiple formats. So Sphinx is what's actually doing the outputting of uh, HTML, PDFs, EPUBs, all these other kind of formats from that source material. Uh, and then read the docs builds on top of Sphinx and does that automatically for you as a service on the web. So restructured text. Restructured text is what you call a lightweight markup language. And so what that means is that it is a base format to generate other formats from. It's kind of the single source of truth for your documentation. It is where everything else kind of comes from. So you, you change it in one place, and then your HTML and your PDF, you know, everything else kind of generates out from there. So you only have that one place you have to worry about keeping things up to date. Uh, and in general, lightweight markup languages are readable as plain text. That's kind of the goal, is for the, you to be able to read them while you're editing them, as well as you know, turning into nice formats for users to consume them in. And kind of the best, in my opinion, the best kind of attribute of this is that you're working with plain text files. So all of your programmer tools work with them, right? You can diff them, you can send them in a pull request. All of the kind of tools that we've built up around collaborating, interacting on source code also works for plain text documentation files. And that's a really, really powerful attribute because we can keep the same workflows that we're using, you know, whether it be you know, Dropbox with a bunch of stuff in it or GitHub or you know, sending patches around an email. Whatever you're doing, the same workflow will apply with these things. And the really kind of powerful thing that you can do with these is they have something that is they're semantically meaningful. And so this is kind of the power of HTML. Uh, there was like a big semantic HTML revolution maybe eight to 10 years ago. I don't know if people remember that. Uh, I'll explain it in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, but semantics, kind of the underlying concept is you're saying what something is, and you're not talking about kind of the display or anything else. You're just saying when you're writing it, you know, this is a type of object, and in the text, it actually is kind of wrapped in that meaning so that other tools know what they're working with. Uh, I'll show an example on the next slide. Oh, what's LWML? Uh, it's a lightweight markup language. Oh, 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 so, okay. Yeah, that's, sorry. <laughs> um, and then, kind of your, your the, the thing that's meaningful is that once you know what something is, you can figure out how to display it, but you're kind of splitting those steps into two different things. So when you're authoring a document, all you have to care about is what you're writing about, and not what it'll look like for your users or what it's going to look like for any other kind of thing. So here's kind of the classic HTML example. So here's what you shouldn't do. It's just like, oh, we're talking about like issue 72 on this project, you know, but we want to call out the issue, and so we just make it bold. Right? Like, it's issue 72, of course it's bold. You know, what you should be doing semantically is you, you know, wrap it in something that is a class issue. And so you're just, when you're writing it, you're saying, you know, this text is an issue. And then someone along can come along later and use CSS and say, all right, issues are now all bold. So all of the issues in the page have consistent markup. And when you're authoring the document, you don't have to care what it looks like. You're just like, this is an issue. That's what I care about. So kind of using a restructured text example, so here we're saying, you know, this is bad, this is a warning, don't do this. You know, let's make it red. That's bad. We should say, it's like, this is a warning. Let's just like wrap it in a class that's warning. And then we'll make it look some, like something else later. And what that looks like in restructured text is just, you know, warning. I'll explain kind of the syntax in a minute. Don't do this. And so you're not, you don't even care about HTML, right? This is like a base format that will generate HTML, but it'll also generate a PDF. It'll also generate a man page. You have something that's much more powerful in this kind of base thing where it's like, this is a warning. And then we'll figure out both what the display of that looks like and the output text at a later point in time. And that's the really powerful thing about working with something much lower level um, that has semantics. Is the uh, dot dot significant? 
Yeah, yeah. So that's that's just like in a file of uh, restructured text. You say like dot dot warning, and that, that's actually what you're writing that will be generated in the Hologram. Right. Right. Okay. Um, but I'll in a couple slides I'll explain the format a little bit. I agree with ugly and weird looking. <laughs> Um, so yeah, sem semantic markup, it shows the intent of your words, and that's really powerful because it works across output formats. You're just writing this very pure language that's just describing what something is, and you don't care anything else about it. And then right, you can style it differently across HTML, PDF, all these other things. So just to touch on kind of the classic argument here, of Markdown, like everyone uses Markdown, it's kind of like the de facto web short uh, lightweight markup language. Markdown is effectively just shorthand for HTML. So when you're writing Markdown, you're just writing HTML with fancier ways to write tags. It, it goes as far as to allow you to embed HTML into a Markdown document, because that, that is what it is. It is just a nicer way to write HTML. Restructured text does much, much more than this. It is a much more complex thing. It's really building a hierarchy of semantic objects that it then uses in different ways and has more control over. That sounds really complex. Like, I'm even scared of the words I just said. But that complexity makes the language more complex, and so it's uglier. Um, so just when you look at it, don't be immediately turned off by the fact that it's not nearly as nice and pretty as Markdown. A lot of that is because it is doing something much fundamentally much different and substantially harder. And the kind of takeaway here is if you care about what you're writing, please write it in a way that preserves semantic meaning. Whether it be HTML, write your HTML in a semantic way. If you have a choice, write it in some kind of you know, lightweight markup language or I think you know, things like DocBook and there's other tools that documentation people use that have these kind of semantic concepts in them. But like if, you're, if you really care about what you're writing, you should make sure that that semantic meaning is preserved because it's really a lot of work to go back and re-add it to a set of documents. And so I know this is kind of like hand wavy and kind of crazy, so I just want to kind of give folks an example of what this actually looks like so you can you know, wrap your head a little bit more around what it is. So this is just kind of an online kind of editor. So on the left here is the plain text, restructured text. And here is just the HTML output that it generates. So if we go down here, this basically just looks like a markdown document. So you know, to denote a header, you just put a line under something, and that turns it into a header in HTML output or PDF or whatever else. Um, you know, like lists are just, you know, put a dash in front of it and you create lists, and that turns into a list in output. Um, so this looks very similar. Um, Here's a code, a code block. Here's like, I want to embed some you know, source code. So here's a code block, and then you put the code in, and that outputs this fancy little, you know, properly formatted piece of code in the HTML. Uh, so this, this is, is that's a class? Uh, so it's called a directive. A direct? Yeah, uh, I'll explain that in a bit. But I just wanted to kind of like let you kind of wrap your head around what restructured text looks like. So I know from that description, it's not exactly obvious kind of what the day-to-day -day working of it will be. And so that, that part is very similar to kind of Markdown. And so the really cool stuff is the restructured text supports these directives. So here you can see over here we have kind of a table of contents. And here you can just see this little contents thing with the table of contents, right? And so in your plain text, if we remove that, you know, the table of contents goes away. So if you're just writing a document and you're like, all right, I want to add a table of contents, you just, you know, do contents, and it like goes through the document, pulls out all the headings, turns it into a table of contents, and then you know you can pass like a, a header of you know <laughs> pass whatever you want into it, and that will create a table of contents. Uh, over here, you can see the sections are all numbered. If we remove this little you know sec num directive, it removes all the numbering from those kind of things. So that's the kind of the power that it gives you, right? Is you have this kind of plain te plain text document. But then you have these directives that are incredibly powerful that can then edit it and do things to it and work with it to give you really, really nice output. Um, and then that output works in your HTML, in your PDF, all these kind of things. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like if you're working with it. This stuff is why it's really cool. <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna explain kind of 
the conceptualization around that next. But I just wanted people to kind of have an idea of what working um, with it would be. And so all of those directives are kind of where you're able to extend restructured text, which is what Sphinx does. So it takes kind of this base language and adds other directives that you can use to do cool stuff for a document. That's kind of the main thing that Sphinx is. Um, so as, as someone pointed out, uh, page level markup is just a line that starts with two periods in the space and ends at the next unindented line. So very similar to Python, uh, so you did that, two dots, space, and then everything that's within that block just stays indented. And then when you have no more indention, that's kind of the end of that you know, thing. And the main important part of page level markup is a directive. So it's like dot dot, directive name, two colons. And that's kind of the main source, as I was uh, kind of saying, uh, of the extendability of restructured text. And that's where Sphinx really shines, is it adds a lot of you know, custom directives to the language. So kind of the example again is like our code block. You can see here the dot dot, calling code block. Uh, and then this is just kind of, these are arguments. And then this is just options. So you're like saying, all right, this is, this is going to be Python. And then we want to include line numbers in the output. And then as you can see here, this is indented. And so this is the actual code block. And so that is what you would write in your source file. And it will turn in to, you know, highlighted, you know, code block with line numbers. If you remove the line numbers thing, you know, the line numbers will go away. Um, pretty, pretty, yeah? Sorry, so the, the highlighting, um, obviously that's Python type highlighting because you yes. pulled it with Python. Uh, I assume you can, like, change the colors and things with CSS? Yes. Okay. Uh, in HTML. Yes. But, so when it does PDFs, obviously it's a little bit trickier to change the text highlighting. Because we can talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Uh, it's just, it uses latex, which scares and confuses me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, so that, that is kind of like, if you want to do things at the page level, you use directives. Those are kind of outside of the prose that you're writing. Uh, the other main thing that you can do is you can actually use inline markup. So this is anything that's actually included within the content of the text that you're using itself. So like inside of the prose that you're writing, you can also have functionality. And that's kind of used for embedding things into your prose. So the main thing that Sphinx uses are called interpreted text roles, and they're kind of the classic example of inline markup. And that looks like you know a role with two columns around it and a target with two back, uh, back ticks. And so here's an example of, in Python, there's just, uh, like, the language specification is called pep, and they're numbered. So if you just wanted to link to pep8, you would say, you know, pep8. And then that, in the HTML output, that would create a URL link to the online source for the pep. So instead of having to, you know, actually add in a link to a URL, you have something that's much more kind of functional and is more almost like a function call inside of your text. So what if you don't want to use it specifically to like code base? What if I wanted to just link to something else, like a TOS or? Yeah, I mean you can just include links into your text. Okay. This is just kind of a, another thing that you can do. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if there was a markup for links. Yes, there is. Um, I'm not really covering like the total markup for restructured text, okay. but that's definitely like all of the standard kind of things you would expect in generating HTML, there's ways to do it. Okay, got it. Um, so this is kind of a, a, an example that I'll explain a little bit later. But here we're saying, you know, I want to reference some other thing with a label. And here is where we actually kind of specify a label. So if you have like two different pages in your documentation and you want to kind of cross-reference them, on one of them you can add a label to it. And if over here you can say, I want to link to that. And that will, you know, you click on it and it drops you into that section of the page. That's really cool for HTML, but that also works with PDFs, right? That works with all the different kinds of output, which is really, really cool. And so with that, and this is actually referencing itself. Um, so when you actually render that into HTML, right, it just turns into a link that by default links to kind of the title of the section you're linking to. Um, but, you know, in reality, you would generally do that across pages. Um, but it's much easier, as an example, just to do it to itself. 
Um, yeah, so these are kind of the two major extension points that Sphinx is going to use kind of later on to add neat things. Uh, so you have directives for doing things kind of at the page level, and then you have interpreted text rules for doing things within the content and the prose that you're writing. So just kind of an, an overview of uh, restructured text. It's the best kind of lightweight markup language that I know of. It kind of gives you all these semantic, uh, semantically powerful meanings, uh, semantically meaningful things. Uh, and it's also incredibly extensible, which is cool. So you can add your own kind of verbs and things into it, which is what Sphinx does, which I'll explain next. Um, and if you want, that little kind of live preview thing that I was playing with is online. That's at rst.njs.org. Uh, so I'll put the slides, we'll get posted later, but if you want to go and really just kind of poke around with the markup, you can do that online and it'll, you know, live update into the HTML output. Questions? This is kind of like a specific question, but say I'm generating documentation not for a program. Mm -hmm. Should I stick that, all that Sphinx documentation? Files into a docs folder in Git repo, or should I just put that in the Git repo? Files would read the docs. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, yeah, so read the docs just searches for the configuration file over Sphinx, and anywhere in the repo I'll find it, or you can specify an explicit path. But any other people kind of understand what I'm talking about? How to get it? I didn't, I didn't delve really far into the language semantics. I was just kind of trying to focus on the interesting parts. Um, so please kind of go back and, like, you're not meant to have a, a full picture of what restructured text is, just kind of why it's, it's interesting and, you know, how Sphinx will use it to, for neat things, which is what we'll talk about now. So understanding Sphinx. Um, Sphinx is a general tool. It's really easy, kind of classic which kind of points to your question. The classic layout is, you know, within your project, you have a docs directory, and within that, you have a comp.py, which is Sphinx's configuration file, and then you have a make file, which just is a way for shortcuts. So you can just say make HTML or make PDF, and you don't have to call like, kind of the full command to Sphinx, which makes it a little bit easier to use. And then you just have all of your restructured text files inside of that. You can put them in folders or you know, whatever else you want to use, but this is all the, really the comp files all Sphinx needs. This is just for, to make it nicer to use. And then you just have lots of files on your, your system. And then, you know, you put whatever RST files you have in your directory, and then you just call make HTML. That runs Sphinx and outputs HTML. That's kind of the basic workflow that you'll use if you're just trying to kind of evaluate Sphinx and you know, see what it can do. Like I said, making PDFs is a little more complicated because PDFs are awful. Um, so, you know, kind of a lot of the examples and the easy kind of things will use HTML because it's you know, the easiest kind of output to work with. Um, and it's the best documentation tool I know. Um, I run Read the Docs, which is only supports Sphinx. And for a long time, I've been looking for other tools like it to support on Read the Docs that use Markdown, for example. And there's just they're starting to get there. Like the world's starting to develop these kind of tools for Markdown, but they're adding all sorts of crazy extensions to Markdown. It's like Markdown doesn't support cross-referencing, right? Because it's HTML, it just has links. And there's lots of other kind of complexity there where they're adding things to Markdown to make it do things that Sphinx does. Um, but for the most part, it's still the most, by far, the most mature kind of documentation tool uh, that I know of that kind of fits into this category. And there's a great community around it, and lots of prior art, and lots of extensions that exist. And, you know, there are things that are you know, there for you that you don't have to build. And I mean, so that you know I'm serious, I built an entire website around it. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not kind of like backfilling my love for this. Like, I actually, you know, my actions show that I think it was awesome. So what is, what is Sphinx doing for restructured text? Like, what is it adding? So one of the really kind of cool things that it adds is the concept of a table of contents tree. And so this is what gives you the concept of a hierarchical notion of documents. So most uh, most things projects, you know, you can have an index page, which is what you land on at the top level. And then you can kind of include other documents into a top tree, and that gives Sphinx a concept of like, 
the actual hierarchy of your documentation. So it can, you know, provide a table of contents that is actually, you know, indexed correctly, where it's like, you know, this page goes here and, you know, like, spans out in a tree properly. Um, and that's something that's really cool, because that's one of the main ways that you can kind of add the concept of like hierarchy and like interlinking of documents uh, together, which is really important. Uh, a lot of documentation tools just render a page and a page and a page, and there's no concept of like the whole thing as a whole project. Um, and this is one of the things that really kind of like ties that all together. Uh, the other really powerful thing, uh, like I showed a little bit earlier, is cross-referencing. So this allows you to cross-reference things in other documents within your project. This is kind of the other really major way that Sphinx kind of pulls the project together from kind of disparate documents. One of the really, really cool things is there's a thing called Inner Sphinx, which actually lets you link to things in other projects. So you can actually you know, link within pages of your own, <laughs> within pages of your own project, but then you can also link to pages in other Sphinx projects, which is really, really neat. So, for example, if I want to link to something in like the official Python documentation, I don't have to include like a URL to the Python documentation. I can use all of the power of this and say, you know, I want to reference, you know, within the Python documentation, the keywords document, which is really cool because then if Python changes their documentation and moves their keywords around, all my links don't break. Right? I'm, I'm working in a much more kind of like semantically meaningful. Way, and I'm just saying I'm going to link to Python's keyword stock. And then that will you know, magically change based on where the keyword stock is, which is really cool. Um, if you want to link to something kind of within your own project, you can you know, just say, you know, I want to link to the document that is the source. Um, and there's other kind of ways of interlinking things. Um, those are the two kind of two big ones are the referencing and then just linking to actual documents. And then the other kind of really kind of cool thing that makes Sphinx good for documentation is it adds tons of code-specific kind of semantic markup. So if you're like writing your documentation and you want to refer to like an environmental variable or something, right? There's like a way to say, you know, this is an environmental variable. And then Sphinx knows that this, you know, string is an environmental variable. And so then later it can build an index of all of them or, you know, all these other kind of powerful things in that context. Uh, you can link to you know, RFCs, tokens, keywords, like there's all these nouns that we as programmers know that Sphinx gives you the ability to talk about in semantically meaningful ways inside of your documentation. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the RFC example. Um, so say you want to link to like RFC 1984. Uh, you say you know, RFC 1984, and that will generate a link to the RFC 1984 page. Um, since this uh, ships with Sphinx, it knows about a URL on the internet that the RFCs live at, but that's overridable, right? So if there's this thing called pretty RFC, which like renders RFCs nicer, so you want to go through and like change all the links in your documentation to this new pretty way, you just add you know one line in your config file that's like you know, link all the RFCs to pretty RFC, and then all of these little things in your documentation just magically point somewhere else. Right? This gives you kind of the ability to refactor where your links go. It gives you this kind of programmatic things we take for granted in programming, and you can do it within the context of your documentation, which is really, really neat. Um, so for syntax, oh, ten minutes. Uh, so syntax highlighting, which you uh, touched on, that uses a library called Pigments, which can basically highlight everything. I think there's like three hundred different kind of things it knows how to highlight it. You can do Nginx config files and bash and Python and you know a million other things. You just have to have it install yeah. all on the side. So when you install Sphinx it pulls it in. It already will pull it in. Um, and so yeah right so when you say you know, source code Ruby that's calling into pigments and saying this is Ruby highlighted as such. In HTML output it has CSS classes and then ships with default styles that you can override. Um, if you don't pass a uh, source code to it, it will try and figure out what it is, which might work. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's usually better to be explicit. Um, and then Sphinx itself is incredibly extendable as well. Uh, so it has an entire extension API built into it, and it ships with lots of useful extensions. Um, one is a dot test runner, which will actually go through and execute every code block in your documentation and 
you can actually add like tests around it. So you can test that your code in your documentation actually is correct. So you can add you know tests into your documentation, which is really really cool. Um, you know, there's things for Graphviz support, MathJax if you want to embed images or you know uh, fancy math symbols and all that kind of stuff. It's all built for you. Um, yeah, there's there's lots of extensions that are shipped, and then there's lots of third-party extensions as well. And then one of the kind of main ones that people in the Python world use uh, that it's shipped with is called AutoDoc, which pulls doc strings from your classes. So it's basically a way of just pulling out the comments from your Python code and including it in your documentation. Uh, this only works for Python at the moment because it's really hard to support every language ever. Um, that's something I'm really interested in is kind of building out this functionality in a generic way. Um, but yeah. So anyway, what that looks like is you just you're like, you know, this is a class, you get Django core views, and that just like, pulls out you know, the comment for that class. So you can include it into your documentation, uh, which is pretty cool. So yeah, Sphinx. Um, it's a documentation generator that takes you know, a directory full of restructured text files. Uh, in those restructured text files, you can use all of this kind of fancier markup and other cool things. Uh, and then it will generate kind of HTML and PDFs for you. And it adds, like I said, lots of you know, nice markup for writing tech documentation specifically. Questions? So you said HTML and PDF, and you said it will do a lot of different formats than that, like MediaWiki? Uh, no, so it only outputs kind of user well, things. Like it wouldn't output MediaWiki because that's kind of another input. So if you want to form, go between formats, you can use Pandoc. It is a fantastic tool that will convert everything to everything. Like you can do markdown to HTML or you know restructure text to markdown or like it's like twenty different things into twenty different things. Uh, highly recommend Pandoc. You said Pandoc, so that's all of them. Yeah, P A N D O C. All right. So now is we have this cool tool to generate documentation. This is where I come in. I build Readbox, which builds and hosts your Sphinx documentation. Um, at this point, it's the de facto hosting provider for Python documentation, which is pretty, pretty cool. Coming from the Python world, it makes me happy. If people are using my open source code, it fills me with joy. If you document your code, you can be filled with joy too. Uh, it was created in 48 hours in 2010, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then it provides a bunch of stuff on top of Sphinx that I will talk about. So first off, the story. So this is 2010, Django Dash is a 48-hour coding competition. It's like over a weekend. And my friend uh, Charlie, Bobby, and myself were like, we want to do this. And this is the problem, is that hosting our documentation is awful. So there's this thing called packages.python.org, where you would just upload a zip file of HTML, and it would unzip it and host it for you. It's like, oh, that's, like, was that 1980s technology? It's like FTP. Uh, GitHub Pages is the other one where instead of uploading a zip, you put it in a Git repo and push it. And you're still just kind of like putting HTML files on a server. And what I was doing was actually running a cron job on my server that would pull down my repository every five minutes, generate the HTML, and then serve it. Um, so the problem with all these is that it doesn't keep anything up to date, right? It's up, it's up to you to, you know, kind of build your documentation and put it there. You know, we're web developers, right? We have technology. We can rebuild. We had a workable site in 48 hours that did this kind of very basic generation of documentation. And it was open source, which is kind of awesome. So fast forward today, had 118 people that have contributed code, we almost 4,000 commits, 850 issues, we've done 1.5 million builds of documentation, and we've done over 150 million page views, like, over all time, we're getting about 9 million a month. And this blog post kind of has more stats and interesting numbers. It's what our traffic looks like. I call this the linear growth FUVCs, sustainable, you know, open source growth model. <laughs> <laughs> FUVCs, yeah, what does that stand for? Uh, it's, it's a very, you know, cryptic. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's kind of where we are now with the project. But like, cool people use it. Why are they using it? We have a beautiful theme. Uh, so the default Sphinx theme is obviously developed by a programmer. <laughs> um, and so we got a real designer to build a theme that is delightful and beautiful. And 
doesn't quite show as justice here, but it's just using the crappy default theme. <laughs> <laughs> but if you um, if you upload it to read the docs, you can magically turn the crappy, crappy default into our beautiful. Uh, and then we do things uh, for versions. So a lot of projects will you know, tag different releases and have different branches for versions. So you basically give us a version control repository, we'll pull it down, and we'll take all of your tags and branches and turn those into versions of the documentation that you can build. So what's really cool about this is we build and post old versions of docs. So if you know the world's moved on to you know, 1.7 and you're stuck on 1.5, like, that, those docs still exist and are on the internet. And you're not just like stuck with like, uh, we only have one version of the docs and they're the latest and they don't apply to my software, which is happens a surprising amount. So this is a really important thing that we provide. The other really cool thing we do is post commit hooks. So when you commit code, GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever will ping us, we'll pull down your code and keep it, uh, rebuild it and update it. So your code is always up to date with whatever's in your repo, or your docs are always up to date with your code, which is a really cool attribute. Because um, your docs are always up to date, and they're not you know, lagging behind and two weeks out of date somebody hasn't uploaded the website. So just to be clear here, that only happens if you update your docs at the same time you update your code, right? Right, I mean, it's re it rebuilds whatever you have. Oh, okay. So it, it matches what's in the repo, not necessarily that you actually updated your documentation. Okay. Hopefully, you did. <laughs> you could do this with anybody that has uh, commit hooks, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we have a generic yeah. commit hook as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the cool things we do is we do translations. So if you have you know, a Japanese version or a German version, we'll host that as well. We also localize our site. So I think our, lo our site's localized into eight languages. So if you're in China and you go to readthedocs.org, it'll show up in Chinese, which is pretty cool. We do search, so we full, te we full text index all of the documentation and do Elasticsearch, provide an index and an API to that. We do CNAMES, so if you have your own domain and you don't want to have a .readthedocs.org, you know, so when eventually we go away into the internet and the indie web wins, <laughs> you, you maintain control of the documentation, like the domain that everyone has linked and Google saved and all these things. Uh, we build all the different formats for your docs. And one of the things that's really cool is like, I'm an ops person historically, uh, uh, also while being a dev. So I know how to architect this stuff and serving static files is really easy. Um, so it's really highly available and we've never had any kind of real multi-hour downtime for the serving of our documentation in almost four years, uh, which is pretty cool. And then we do lots of other little small things. Uh, so you can serve multiple projects on a C name, and we have support for uh, Python 3. And you know, there's you know, management, of, you know, so multiple people can manage the thing, and other, other stuff that becomes important as you do more advanced stuff. So using Read the Docs, you register for an account, and you import your project with a repo, and that's it, basically. As long as you have Sphinx documentation in there, we'll pull your repo down, find your configuration, run Sphinx, generate HTML, and have support you. Pretty, pretty neat. Right. So I don't so have we're, time we're, for we're demo. Out of time. If people are willing to stay, you can just maybe go a few more. All right, yeah, well, I can just do like a two second demo, but I'll go ahead and finish. Recap, hopefully you've kind of discovered why you should write documentation, or at least you have arguments to explain to people why they should write documentation. Uh, you understand why restructured text and Sphinx exist, how, a little bit about how they work, and kind of why they're neat and cool technologies. And Read the Docs is awesome. I might not have convinced you of that. If you go and try it, hopefully you'll enjoy it. So there's some resources, docs.writethedocs.org. Uh, it's documentation on writing documentation, which is kind of cool. Um, docs.readthedocs.org is documentation on read docs. So if you're curious about that. And then sphinx.org is the Sphinx documentation. Um, we're out of time for questions, but I kind of wanted it to be that way, which is why I put them in the middle of the talk. Um, so come around, I'll be at the conference, so if you want to kind of chat more about stuff, feel free. One more thing. This is what Read the Docs looks like when you're logged in and you're in English. Then when you're in Japan, this is what it looks like. I just think that is like the coolest thing. <laughs> so thank you for your time. Don't want to